and welcome, family. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we're so excited to be with you again today as we share with you another of the apparitions in our series on the many faces of Mary. Thank you so very much for inviting us back into your living room. We're so excited to be here, but we want you to know that we appreciate the fact that you do welcome us, that you do trust that we're going to bring you the real church, the only church, the Roman Catholic Church. We want to take you back to Our Lady of Borang in Borang, Belgium in the year 1932. This is one of the last approved apparitions of Our Lady in the early 20th century. There are so many parallels that Our Lady gives us between 1932 and 1992. You know, we've been so busy videotaping this series that we haven't had time to just sit and share with you the insights we believe our Lord and Our Lady are giving us. We'd like to be able to do that with you this time. As we awakened this morning, Bob and I started to share about what was happening to our world at that time. The 20s were a wild age, an anything goes age. It, it just got to, I would say, epidemic proportions. And we got more and more from that false god. Nothing could stop us. Everything we wanted was ours just for the taking until the crash. And because we had put our loyalty, our faith, our eyes on the false god, we crashed with the economic crash. People were throwing themselves out of windows. It was devastating. People didn't know who to turn to, so we went into, we plummeted into a depression. Yes, and it was not only an economic depression, but it was a depression of the spirit. We had given up on morality. In, in the year 1932, morality was not as important. It, in the 20s, it had not been important at all. Just have a good time was important. We're going into the 1990s now. We seem to be a very self-centered people. We think that Our Lady is trying to share something very important with us as she parallels 1932 and 1992, the godlessness of both ages. She came to these children twice. I mean, two, two apparitions within, what was it, six weeks? Six weeks of each other. Two apparitions within six weeks. How many times is she coming now? We know what was about to happen because we know our history. We know that Belgium would be devastated, that Hitler and the Nazi soldiers would come through. What's to happen here? Is, is this godliness going to take over our world? We continue our journey in search of the many faces of Mary. Our Lady takes us to a small village in the southwest of Belgium, about five kilometers from France. It is a storybook setting, a beautiful little village on the banks of the river and of unassuming proportions. It is in the fall of the year, 10 days before the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for bringing us here to the shrine of Our Lady of Borang, where Our Lady appeared to five young people on November the 29th, 1932, and for 33 consecutive visits. Our Lady came on the eve of destruction. She seems to always come, just as everything is about to blow up. And she came to warn her children of this impending disaster and to reassure them that she and her son would never leave them. We want you to come back with us now to the year 1932. We're in the midst of a major worldwide depression. Nazi Germany is growing. The dark cloud is coming all over Europe. Pretty soon they will overrun this little country of Belgium as they did in the First World War. It is against this setting that Our Lady comes to take care of her children, to comfort, console, and warn her children. And she always comes 
to the simplest people, sometimes people that you would least judge that you would come to, and those are the ones. These children were part of a family that were just trying to survive. World War I had been very hard on the people of this world, and now they were in the throes of depression. And Our Lady is going to bring them out of that depression to give them strength and courage for the next valley that they'll have to go into on the road to Calvary. Our Lady appeared 33 times to five children, five children of two families. And uh, those children did not expect at all any kind of apparition. The apparition occurred this way. On the 25th, sorry, the 29th of November, 1932, a girl of 13 year old was staying in the evening study of that convent school. And normally, her father would come and take her home at about half past six. Here on the 29th of November it is very dark and the parents did not want the child to come home on her own. But this evening Mr. Voisin had to work at the railway station and the mother sent two other children. A big girl of 15 and a half Fernand de Voisin and her little brother Albert, who was 11 years old. Those two, on their way, did all kinds of mischief. They went ringing and running, pushing <laughs> shop doors, things like that, went banging on the window of Mrs. de Gimbre's kitchen. She was having supper with her two daughters and they wanted to join also. That was André de Gimbre, 14 years old, and the little Gilberte, who was nine years old. The four of them came playing and running from the first street on the right. They went in the direction of the bridge, and before the bridge, they entered into the garden. They simply ran to the door of the convent. It was Albert who was the fastest, and he pushed the bell knob. They waited for a rather long time because the rather elderly sister Valeria needed all her time to come and open the door. And Albert became impatient. He turned around, <laughs> and suddenly the four girls who were with him noticed that he looked very much afraid. And he pointed to the sky and shouted, there is somebody in white walking through the sky above the railway bridge. At first the girls did not believe him because they thought he's going on with his jokes. But he looked so long and so frightened that they themselves turned around also and they saw a shining apparition walking on a cloud with the hands joined. She was lighting, really spreading light out mm. on all sides and she was walking like somebody who goes in a procession. That was a description of the children. At last, the sister opened the door. She went laughing because she did not see anything. But a girl, which they came to meet at the end of the evening study, looked at the sky and said, oh. And they were suddenly so frightened that they took each other with the hands and with the heads bent down because they did not want to see they ran home as fast as they could. The parents were not pleased at all. 
Mrs. de Gembre, a pious widow, she said, make one of those stones of my kitchen float through the air, then I shall believe you. <laughs> and now Thomas. you go to bed without supper, because I can't accept that my daughters are telling lies like that. And so it began. What occurred that night of November 29th, 1932, in the house of the widow de Jambre was exactly what continued for the next 34 days and for many years to come, only on a much larger scale. The children faced great opposition from all sides. Actually, they were all alone, except for their heavenly visitor, Our Lady, their parents, their friends, their teachers, the local priest, the mother superior, the police, the civil authorities, all of them badgered the five brave little soldiers in an effort to get them to renounce what they considered lies. But the children could not renounce them because they were not lies. This is one of the most unusual apparitions that we have ever researched in that Our Lady did not say very much. What she said was powerful, but it didn't seem to be enough for the people. For the first three days, she didn't say anything. She just looked at them. And people would say, what did she say? The children answered, nothing. It wasn't actually until December the 1st that she came down off the railway trestle and appeared to them on the hawthorn tree inside the grounds of the school. From that time on, that would be the place where she would visit them. It was on Friday, December the 2nd, in response to questions the people had prodded them to ask Our Lady that she finally spoke to them. They asked her, are you the Immaculate Virgin? She nodded her head and opened her arms. They asked her, what do you want from us? She spoke for the first time. She said to them, always be good. They answered her, yes, we will always be good. The unbeliever's response was, that's it? That's all she said? The sweet, innocent children thought this had been terrific. Yes, they replied excitedly. That's what she said. You can see here where the attitudes of the believers and the unbelievers take hold. Is the glass half empty or half full? The children believed the glass was half full. On the next day, Saturday, December the 3rd, they repeated their questions. Are you really the Immaculate Virgin? She nodded her head again. To the question, what do you want of us? Her response was, is it true that you will always be good? And again they said, yes, we will always be good. On Sunday, December the 4th, they asked her, what day should we come again? She said to them, the day of the Immaculate Conception. They also asked, should we have a chapel built? And she said, yes. Now, when Our Lady specified December the 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, everybody in the town thought that this was going to be the day when she would give them a great miracle. You must remember that anyone who knew anything about Our Lady's apparitions to Bernadette at Lourdes in 1858 or Fatima in 1917, less than 20 years ago, were expecting something special, something really special. And the sadness of it is that in looking for this big, spectacular miracle with lights and fireworks, they missed out on a beautiful miracle. Shall we call it a little miracle? I don't think there are such things as a little miracle. The gift was to the children. For the first and only time during 33 apparitions, she allowed them to go into complete ecstasy. They became oblivious to everything and everyone around them. Doctors had come into the picture by this time. They observed the children during this apparition, noting their behavior when Our Lady was with them. On this day, flashlights were shown in their eyes. Matches were lit under their fingers and hands with absolutely no reaction from the visionaries. They were pinched hard and often, but the trance could not be broken. During these times of torture, they were noted to be smiling as they all looked in the direction of the hawthorn tree. The great sign was given. The miracle was performed for the people, but it was not what they had envisioned or what they wanted. It was not enough. So they said no sign or miracle had occurred. They expected Our Lady to act according to some script they had written, and anyone who knows Mary knows she is not about to do that. 
For many, however, the miracle of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception was a turning point in their believing. It was for the mothers of the visionaries the first time that they had been to church in some time. The local priests, Father Lambert, softened, as did the Mother Superior at the convent school where the apparitions had first taken place. But to make things worse, a series of hysterical people claimed to have apparitions on their own in different places on December the 8th while the children were waiting for Our Lady to come. They claimed to see her on the mountains. Some saw rays coming out of her head. Others claimed to have seen a ball of fire. Their allegations were later determined to be unfounded, but a shadow of darkness fell on the authenticity of the apparitions. The same thing happened during the time of Bernadette. While she was having apparitions of Our Lady at Lourdes, 50 people claimed to have seen Our Lady appear to them, which put a veil of disbelief in the authenticity of the apparitions. It happened here as well. The children never wavered in their belief in what they saw. They were put under excruciating pressure due to the never-ending flow of questions from doctors to government officials to judges to priests and bishops, and the visionaries always said the same thing. And it was easy because they had all experienced the same thing and had seen and heard the same thing during each apparition. The reports matched almost perfectly. As part of the pattern, each time Our Lady came, they all went down on their knees as if they had been pushed down by a strong force. There were those who commented that the noise made from their knees hitting the ground made enough pressure to break the kneecaps of other people, and yet the children never felt pain from it. Also, each night prior to Our Lady's apparition, the children prayed the rosary in a natural voice. However, once she arrived, the voices took on a much higher tone. They also prayed much faster. But then things began to change. All the children did not see the lady each time she appeared. She spoke to some of them and not to others. On two separate occasions, she spoke only to one of them, which had the others upset. But this wound up to be one of the most important keys to the outcome of the apparitions and the message of Our Lady at Borang. On these two separate occasions, Our Lady spoke only to one of the visionaries, Fernand Voisson. There was a reason for this, which we'll see later on. Fernand became very self-conscious about this. She was afraid people didn't believe her when Mary spoke to her alone. She felt they thought she was making up stories to get more attention. She could also feel the resentment of her fellow visionaries. She made it obvious to everyone that she didn't like it when Our Lady spoke to her alone. On Wednesday, December the 28th, Our Lady told the children she would stop coming to them very soon. This made them extremely sad. They knew it was coming eventually, but nobody wanted to face up to it. Now it had become a reality. On December the 29th, as Our Lady was giving her farewell to the children, she opened her arms to expose a brilliant golden heart. This was the first time she had done this. Because of this, she has been given the title, The Lady with the Golden Heart. Obviously, she was making reference here to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. On December the 30th, she showed her golden heart to the children again. She told them, pray, pray very much. On December the 31st, she revealed her golden heart once more. On Sunday, January the 1st, 1933, Fernand did a foolish thing. The tradition had been that when Our Lady moved her lips to speak, the children would stop praying so they could hear her words. During this apparition on January the 1st, when Our Lady began to move her lips to speak to the children, Fernand was afraid she would speak to her alone, so she continued praying and lowered her eyes so she could not hear what Our Lady wanted to say. Two days later, she would be very sorry she had done this. On that Sunday, Mary said to the children, pray always. She also told them she would not see them again after January the 3rd. On January the 3rd, 1933, the children waited for the lady to come. All of a sudden, they went down on their knees, all except Fernand. She looked around in amazement, then slowly went down on her knees. She got up. She was in tears. She said, I can't see her. The lady was there. She was more beautiful than they had ever seen her. She was brilliant. Her eyes, her lips, everything about her glistened. 
She spoke to each one of the children. First she gave them a message, then she gave them a secret, then she said goodbye. When she finally got to the last one, Andre, she said, I am the mother of God, the queen of heaven. Pray always. Then she said goodbye and disappeared. During this time, Fernand prayed for all she was worth. She shut her eyes hard, prayed, and then opened them. She couldn't see anything. She looked at the expressions on the faces of the other children. She knew our lady was speaking to them. There were tears in their eyes. Fernand was in a state of panic. The children began to rise. It was over. The crowd dispersed. Fernand looked around, bewildered. Someone suggested they pray the rosary again. Our lady might return. The children went down on their knees again and prayed the rosary. The lady did not return. Finally, they got up and walked towards the grotto. Fernand cried out, I want to see her. She was all alone on her knees praying. The crowds began to thin out. They bumped into her on the way to the grotto in pursuit of the other children. We can only assume what she might have been praying to Our Lady. Please, please come back to me. Don't leave me this way. All of a sudden, a crack of thunder shot through the evening sky, followed by a ball of fire which landed on the hawthorn tree. Everyone could see it. The crowd froze. They turned their attention back to the hawthorn tree. Fernand broke into a smile. Our ladies was there. Those eyes, those radiant eyes, rested on the face of the child. Mary waited a moment, then spoke to Fernand. Do you love my son? Yes, she cried out. Do you love me? Oh, yes. Then sacrifice yourself for me. Fernand wanted to keep the lady there, but Mary opened her arms, shone more brilliantly than ever, and exposed her golden heart. She looked at Fernand lovingly and then said goodbye. Then she left. Fernand collapsed in tears, her entire body shaking uncontrollably. And those three short sentences, my brothers and sisters, constitute the message of Our Lady at Borang. We would have to sacrifice. She would never let us down. She would not fail us. Oh, she knew what was to come in a very short time to this little country of Belgium, to this continent of Europe, to the whole world. She was preparing us for Holocaust. Our world right now is struggling. And many of us, we cannot pick up the paper, put on television, that we're not concerned about what's happening around the world. But I do have to tell you that being here and seeing the youth, seeing all these beautiful people, a charismatic renewal from Belgium and France, I have hope. Our lady is here. She has never left. We have been on Mount Tabor here, and we know that from Mount Tabor, Jesus had to walk through the way of the cross. Belgium would know the way of the cross, but Belgium would also know resurrection. And that's what we see in the Belgium of today at the shrine of Our Lady of Borang, Our Lady of the golden heart. Do you love my son? Do you love me? Then sacrifice yourself for me. We believe that this was the major message of Our Lady at Borang, Belgium. Believe in me, and I will believe in you. And this message that she gave us six weeks later in Banu, why? Why two apparitions? Were they two different messages or were they two parts of one message? And why are you seeing this today?
Why did you see this today? Why is it coming to you at this time in your life? Do you believe that what's happening today on many different messages, mixed messages from Our Lady, or do you believe that they're all part of one message for us at this crucial time in history? We have said over and over again that so many are going to hell because no one will pray or sacrifice. So many are turning to drugs and, and to materialism and to uh, living a single life, a life outside of their sacrament of marriage. So many are sinning because they do not believe in themselves. And in not believing in themselves, they have turned away from that God who does believe in them. 1932, 1992. Have we changed in the last 60 years? It seemed in those days that we were hell-bent on destruction. Today it seems as if we've accelerated we're on a crash course towards destruction. 1932 was to lead up to 1939. Oh, it was a year of hope for the American people. We were going to come out of this terrible depression. Well, little did we know that in 1939, all the, the elements in, in Nazi Germany that had been coming up, that we had ignored, would blow up in our faces. They tell us that in the Second World War, 10 million people were killed. From 1973 until the present, 30 million people were killed from abortions. Our Lady says to us, believe in me. I will believe in you. And you know, you wonder how she can keep reaching out to us, but she does. Pray. Do you love me? Do you love my son? Pray, pray and sacrifice. Believe in me. I believe in you. <laughs>